Right, so I'm, I'm, so where, where does architecture begin? Um, for me, architecture ultimately begins and ends in the code, because that's the thing that is ultimately real. And a lot of people tend to consider code to be a detail. The problem is that that is exactly what software is. Software is lots and lots of details, all put together in a particular way. It's, no, it's not hand-waving. We might do that in meetings. We might do that at whiteboards. It might help us think. Sometimes it might prevent us from thinking. But ultimately, it comes out in the detail. That's where it actually happens. And so I'm not, uh, so I have this kind of issue here is that I'm in the security track. And you know, apart from feeling reasonably secure within myself, that's about as far as security goes for me. I don't, that's not an area of specialization. But one thing that is specialized, or rather an area of interest in which I do specialize, is coding practice, coding quality, how that builds up to be the larger thing. And it turns out there is a surprising overlap between these two areas. If you want to reduce the attack surface area of your software, it's no good just looking in one direction and saying we've got it covered by frameworks, or these guys have got our back, we're using the right operating system. It's a full 360. And I want to cover one aspect of that which is often neglected. Um, so my background, um, I care deeply about the code, um, and uh, edited this book a few years ago, um, and uh, I also care about the bigger picture. So I've got a couple of books there with the word software architecture in the title, which immediately qualifies me to talk about this. I believe that's all you need. Um, but there's something else I'm known for. Uh, a few years ago, I started taking photographs of software failures in public places. and. Uh, this is, uh, let me think, this is 2006, 2006. Uh, it's Madrid Airport, Terminal 1. And um, this is uh, uh, quite a visible failure, I think it's fair to say. You know, there's lots of people wandering through, kind of looking at that. And you can kind of spot the sort of the more nerdy people whenever this kind of things happen, because they kind of slow down and try and work out what operating system is that? What, what is that? Turns out I've misidentified this for years, and somebody correctly pointed out that um, this was actually uh, a 16-bit networking stack, uh, but they misidentified it as Windows. I tracked it down further. This is DOS. This is a DOS message from a particular networking stack. This is DOS in 2006. OK? DOS had been dead. We were, it, was, the, it has been dead so long that we now think the DOS stands for denial of service. <laughs> and that's what you're getting here. OK? This is, a huge, this is a huge error message. I mean, it's that, it took two photographs. You know, it's just like, ch -ch -ch. And I remember it very vividly, because my, 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 uh, second, my second child, he was, only a f he was only a few months old, and it was pretty much I threw him rugby style to my wife to catch whilst I got out my camera to take a photograph of that, because everybody else is wondering, whoa, look, free packets. That's what people tune into, the word free. Suddenly, everything is good because it's free. Anyway, I got, I got, I got reasonably well. Yeah, I started doing this sometimes in between talks of something, and I also take screenshots. So given that we're going back um, a few years, um, for some of, some of you, this may be a fond memory. <laughs> yeah, you can tell how old it is because I'm still using Mozilla. Um, you know. And I was, uh, I, I used, the, I remember I was trying to see a, a friend of mine uh, visit him in Divendrecht, and I wanted an earlier train. Apparently, there are no earlier trains. There, are, there is only java.lang.null pointer exception. And I used this at a conference in, uh, in Amsterdam a couple of years after I, had this, uh, I took this image. And somebody came up to me afterwards. And he said, Kevlin, you know they still have that bug on the site. And this is, this, is, this is kind of where the penny dropped, where I started realizing that we, in failure, we learn a great deal about a system. We don't simply learn about its technology, the underlying technology. We, if you hadn't guessed it was Java because somebody has decided to plaster the technology all over the URL, why say it's a servlet? Why do people put .asp, .jsp, .php, etc. in their URLs? Did they not learn about encapsulation? Okay, nothing says 
Nothing says encapsulation like a stack trace. OK. Hello. This is full stack development. This is a Hilton website. Uh, it actually goes on for about there. If you want to know what they're using on this site, yeah, fine. If you want to find out the vulnerabilities, there's a software checklist there. <laughs> tick, tick, tick. But this was the other thing you're learning about. You're learning about how, you know, how, how, did a simple, how did a simple error like this get through? Shouldn't there be a big try-catch that basically says, nothing, nothing raw gets out of here? Okay? If something bad happens, we tell, we tell the user, we present them with a message, and we say, you know what, I'm sorry, things didn't work out. And we do that in English or we do that in Dutch, but we don't do it in Java. OK, there's an idea. So how, how could this obvious thing, I mean, it's a really obvious thing. It's practically a mental checklist, check that no exceptions propagate across this boundary. It's all about the boundaries, always about the boundaries. So, so what, what happened? Now, I can't tell you what happened, but, I, but we can throw out some theories. So maybe the developers were not aware of this. Perhaps they were new to Java. Perhaps they were hurried. Perhaps they were against deadlines. Perhaps they were rushed. Perhaps this code was checked in under pressure from management. Perhaps this was all outsourced and nobody actually cared because it wasn't their interest. The fact that it took over two years for them to fix this. In fact, they actually rewrote the site the next time I checked. What does that tell you about the management and the organization around it? In other words, in failure, we actually reveal a profound, something much more profound about how a system is built. But these days, I don't have to take these photographs anymore. Because people send them to me. <laughs> oh, thank you for your object model. I can now see it revealed. <laughs> yeah, people just send them to me. So, you know, I, I've, got, I've got over a thousand of these images that people have sent me. Um, in fact, it's, it's, got, it's got to the point that somebody recently coined a phrase for them. They're apparently, I, I am, I'm, I'm, my name is now being used. I, they are Kevlin Henny screens. <laughs> And you know, once you've got an adjective, then you know, somebody else said, oh, a Kevlin Henny. Apparently, there's more than one of me, which is slightly disturbing. But, um, but yeah, so there you go. So that my name has come to the point that at the Agile in the City conference in Bristol, where I live last year, one of the organizers, John Clapham, came up to me and said, Kevlin, there's a screen downstairs. Quick, I want to take a photograph with you pointing to it, then I'll tweet it, then you retweet it. <laughs> So we kind of like the, you know, we're, the, the snake is eating the tail at this point, OK? But this is an interesting thing. The question you have to ask, these are all, these are all failures at what different levels in the system. But this is a track on security. And the question I put to you is, what is the difference between a failure and a failure? What is the difference between a defect in one aspect and a defect in another? Because a few weeks ago, lots of people were sending me these. From all over Germany, the train system, I've got a couple from the NHS in the UK. This is ransomware. This is the WannaCry malware. This is, so there's the question, what is the difference between one of these and the other? From the user point of view, there is a thing they can no longer do. It happened uh, last year in San Francisco. Um, a lot of people got free rides for a few days because of ransomware. OK, the whole thing was taken down. And some of these are based on spear phishing attacks and therefore the human element. But ultimately, there's the idea that if you can just drive a wedge somewhere in a system, if you know anything about its vulnerabilities, and in this particular case, this is to do with um, not having the right versions of the software, as in running things like XP, which are definitely past their sell-by date. Um, but the point there is that these vulnerabilities exist, and they exist um, at all levels, um, from within the code all the way out to the human level. Now, we're not going to deal with directly with the human level. But I want to make the point here that the user experience of these, from a user's point of view, these are almost equivalent. The user experience and the security experience, which I quite like if we make that sex, that's good. That's, you know, it's much ux. Come on, come on, what kind of is that? Security experience, sex, yeah. But I want to talk about something else, because where does some of this come from? This comes from the programmer experience. What is it like to be in the code? Because people are not generally, one of the things I've discovered is that people in software development are generally not stupid or malicious, okay? But they are often in a hurry. They are often um, confused by multiple priorities. There is so much to know that you cannot know it all. And so there is this idea that 
we need a decent environment in which to work. What is the programmer experience? We often talk about the architecture of a space as just meaning structure. But from my point of view, an architecture is not simply a structural arrangement. It, it defines the quality of living or working in a particular place. What is the quality of being in that code? What is the quality of working within that um, environment? You know, if you're spending eight hours a day in there, what does that feel like? Is it comfortable? Do you enjoy going in there? Or do you feel that, you know, maybe you need to put on armor? Okay, it's, an, it's another day. It's a 10,000 line class. It's me versus the class. You know, what's it going to be? There are no tests. Write your will before you go in. So there's this whole idea, what's the program experience? And we see that this affects things. This is where the details matter because, and this is also where we find the equivalence. So in 2014, there were two um, SSL uh, uh, bugs which arose from very simple coding situations, go to fail and heartbleed. Here's, here's an extract, and I've taken this from, I'm gonna refer to Mike Bland's article a bit later, but here's an extract of the go to fail thing. Now we can have various debates about the, the merits or demerits of the go-to, but this, is in, this comes from a much larger context. It is not immediately obvious that it is correct, and it is not obvious that it is wrong. And this is the point. This is one detail, that one line. That is a detail. Remember those details? People say, oh, don't worry about it. It's just a detail. It turns out it's the difference between a system that works and a system that does not, a system that has vulnerabilities. So all architecture is founded on the details. Ultimately, it comes down to the quality of your mortar, the quality of your screws. It has to be consistent all the way through. Therefore, coding practice is important. Notice that there's almost no difference between that and this recreation of the AT&T bug in 1990, which basically knocked out uh, the uh, telephone network for about 150 million subscribers in North America on a weekday, back in an era when people actually used telephones as tele telephony devices. So that's a lot of business. And this, this comes down because the programmer wasn't really thinking straight and just had a kind of, oh, I'll just put a break in here. This is, this is equivalent to a denial of service attack. This is the point. These things happen. They reveal vulnerabilities. They deny people uh, uh, access to things. They give us a very poor user experience. So this idea, I'm going to quote local boy. Dijkstra, most of our systems are much more complicated than can be considered healthy and are too messy and chaotic to be used in comfort and confidence. And this is true of the outside, but it is also true of the inside. It's, it's what's going on inside the system that we have to care about here. So let's have a little bit of a look at structure. And do we know anything? It turns out we actually know an awful lot. Um, this is a quote from Gerard Holtzman, who um, uh, he's... Uh, uh, one of the uh, chief architects, um, or chief uh, designers and developers at um, NASA's JPL laboratory, and he headed up the software development for uh, the uh, Mars Curiosity rover, which is one of the coolest pieces of space hardware in existence, and wrote this wonderful um, piece uh, for communications of the ACM a couple of years ago, Mars Code. And you can get normally one free read. I strongly recommend this one uh, at that site. There are standard precautions that can help reduce risk in complex software systems. And he lists them. This includes the definition of a good software architecture based on a clean separation of concerns, data hiding, modularity, well-defined interfaces, and stro a strong fault protection mechanisms. That last one is clearly very context-specific. You need fault protection mechanisms if you're going to put a probe on another planet. Because it turns out, if it goes down, you can't easily just, oh, OK, just send somebody into the server room and hit the button. If we could send somebody to the server room and do that, we'd have, we'd have people on Mars. But that's not going to happen right now. So that last one is very context specific. But look at the previous ones. Separation of concerns, data hiding, modularity, well-defined interfaces. These terms are so old, they're practically hanging out with the dinosaur bones. Okay, these are not new concepts. And he's doing this because he's saying, well, this is how you make stuff comprehensible. This is how a human being can understand something. How on earth are you supposed to say that a system is, you know, secure? How are you supposed to say that it is robust? How are you supposed to say all of these things unless you can actually reason about it and tackle it on its own terms? So I have another interest. Amongst many, I mean, obviously, I like taking photographs of books. Um, and I run a page on, on uh, Facebook called Word Friday. And Word Friday, every Friday, I, as the name suggests, I put up a 
definition of an unusual word. And the rest of the week, I just focus on linguistics and other vocabulary, and yeah, it's, it's all good fun. But given that I do like a, I, I actually like dictionaries just for their own sake, I thought I would go and look at the dictionary for the words that I've used in my title. Code as risk. I'm going to say that as is easy enough. Let's just focus on code for a moment. Code, a set of instructions for a computer. Hopefully, we are all comfortable with this. I know it's straight after lunch, but hopefully, we're all good with this. A computer program or a portion thereof. Yeah, this all makes sense. A system of words, figures, or symbols used to represent others, especially for the purposes of secrecy. Ah, yes. It turns out that many people who write code, write code. <laughs> you know, you kind of look at it and go like, Kevin, you're looking at it upside down. Oh, you're right. Yeah, I couldn't quite tell if it was obfuscated. No, 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 it's not obfuscated. That's just my natural style. <laughs> so uh, the point there is we want, to, we want to understand meaning. We want to understand intent. We want to be able to, we want our code quite literally to be reasonable, to be able to reason about it, the classic sense of the word. But there's another meaning of the word code, which I think is interesting here. A set of conventions or principles governing behavior or activity in a particular domain. A code of conduct, for example. The set of practices with which a developer will arrive at the code and collaborate with team members. That is the code, as it were. OK, so let's look at risk. Now, risk is often, often misunderstood. A lot of people say, oh, risk is uncertainty, or risk is hazard, or it's danger. It's not. It's a very, it's a very uh, it's much more specifically defined. So if we go around and dig around, we find a situation involving exposure to danger. And these are the two elements we're going to see running through this. The chance or hazard of commercial loss, a very uh, specific one that is used in the insurance industry. Product of the consequence and probability of a hazardous event or phenomenon. Ah, now this is interesting, because actually this is, we've actually got an equation here. It takes, it takes the basic idea that we can see exposure to a proposition of which one is uncertain. It's not about uncertainty. It's about exposure to uncertainty. That's a very subtle distinction. If you put yourself in harm's way, then that's clearly going to be a worse proposition than keeping yourself out of harm's way. And so there is this idea of exposure to uncertainty. Risk is something we can do something about. In other words, we can reduce exposure, we can reduce uncertainty by doing a number of different things. And it turns out very few of these things are new. But also there's a mindset change. Uh, Kirk Pepperdine a few years ago tweeted this one at me. Um, functionality is an asset, code is a liability. And I remember thinking this is really interesting because I've spent the better part of my career trying to convince people that code is an asset. It turns out that these are both simultaneously true, but they offer us different perspectives. The idea is that what people want is functionality. When you download a new framework, that's what you want, it's functionality. The fact that you might be able to see the source code, that's great. But normally what you want is the functionality. You also want confidence in the functionality. In other words, you want a system around it. That system is a system of people, a community, a sense that other people have used this software and have done so reliably. You want this sense of activity that this system is alive rather than dead. If the last check-in was five years ago, then perhaps don't touch. Okay? You want that kind of responsiveness and reactivity. You want a sense beyond, you want the system beyond the system, so to speak. You're looking for something very specific. That becomes the asset as well. But why is the, co why is the code the liability? Well, I want you to imagine a change to the current system you're working on. Okay, done, good, that was easy. What is preventing you from doing it? What is the friction that prevents you from applying a change? It turns out it's the code. The code is the thing that prevents you from changing the code. Now, why is this a useful construct? Well, it turns out that what companies do when they recognize they have liabilities, if you have a financial liability, you watch it like a hawk. You make sure you minimize your liability. It's not about elimination of liabilities. There are very few companies that have zero liability. What they're trying to do is understand the balance. They're understanding the trade-off. They don't want to have their liabilities run out of control and wipe out their assets. So that's what you do. That's why code as a liability is actually quite a useful construct, because it means you watch it like a hawk. You make sure you have less of it rather than more of it. You make sure that you can understand it. So when somebody says, I have no idea what's going on in this subsystem, but it seems to work, seems is not good enough. The fact that you have no idea, that's a liability. 
You have no, you are exposing yourself to risk and you have no idea there's uncertainty in there. You don't want to be in that position. So the idea that it's a liability is a really useful way of thinking about it. You want to minimize it. You want it to be exactly what you want. You don't want dead code. You don't want incomprehensible code. You want to be able to understand it and that everything there is a necessary part. So that when things change, because it turns out that's one of the most popular things to ever happen to a piece of software, but humans are very bad at recognizing this. We use words like, done. We've even elaborated it. We've even raised it to the power. I even hear people going, done, 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 as if that will somehow assert that it really is done. A system is only done when nobody's using it. It's abandoned at that point. Okay? So you need to be able to create an environment and a situation in which you can change stuff. It's a very simple observation. Complexity, complexity introduces bugs, so therefore avoid it where possible. And this is the other aspect. It reduces vulnerabilities. If you avoid complexity, it reduces vulnerabilities. So what do we normally talk about when we're talking about code complexity and things like technical debt and so on? We normally talk about refactoring, but I want to introduce you to a very simple, um, very simple uh, kind of right-hand rule about how you reason about the changes in your code. Because when we talk about the properties of our code and when we use the language of requirements, we're not very good. We have this very poor vocabulary. When we talk about the semantics of a system, when we talk about its behaviors and interactions, its general correctness, we talk about functional requirements. And then you ask people, OK, so what about the other requirements? And you're stuck for a word. And you go, non-functional. Because they're so important, we don't even have a word for them. And you're saying, what are those requirements? They're the ones that aren't those. You know, we're human beings. Each natural language that humans have has a vast vocabulary to draw on. And the best we can do in English, which has trawled pretty much, ransacked every other language on the planet for its own vocabulary, the best we can come up with is non-functional. The default meaning of non-functional in English, by the way, is does not work. OK? If your washing machine is non-functional, that is not a good thing. We're not talking about availability. Or rather, we are. We're talking about its complete lack of availability. There is not a proper word called non-functional. You need to give it a, But the other thing we do is we collude, we combine, and accidentally create a category that doesn't exist. There are three categories. Or we can split these further, but there are three essential categories that uh, will help us focus. There's the functional stuff. There's the operational stuff, the executional stuff. That's the how does it run, what are its resources, what about time, what about these other illities that people talk about that manifest themselves at runtime. And then there are the developmental qualities of a system. It's maintainability, it's testability. These are developmental. You see, the, the top two are experienced at runtime. The bottom, the bottom category is experienced by developers. Now, these are not perfectly orthogonal, but then again, neither are my fingers, so I'm not worried about that. But it is a useful thinking structure, because what it means is when we are refactoring, what you're doing when you're refactoring is you're trying to hold the functional axis still. And you're trying to improve something about the developmental axis. You're trying to say, I want this to be more readable. I want this to be simpler. I want it to use a more recent version of the language or libraries. You're trying to change something on this. So one remains fixed, and one you go to improve. But the operational axis is open. It's a wild card. It can go either way. It can get faster or slower. They become more or less secure. It can become more greedy for memory or actually more streamlined in memory. In other words, that's not the one we're concentrating on. There's another functionality preserving transformation that's the other way around, which is we focus on functionality. We focus on improving some aspect of the operational side, such as uh, performance tuning. And the developmental aspect is open. Maybe the code gets messier. Maybe it gets better. So. With that in mind, let's just take a piece of code and refactor it. And this is a piece of code I was kind of, in, kind of interested because I was going to create some code and then discovered I actually had a piece of code lying around another talk, which I just tweaked a little bit, um, that's actually based on something from one of my clients. And I've shrouded it and changed everything to protect the innocent and the guilty. Um, but it's a piece of C++ code. And we might say, well, the first pass to security is don't use C++. Yeah, I, you know, if you're a JavaScript programmer, you just tell yourself that, all right? Um, uh, languages do expose themselves more or less to this. And certainly, raw languages that have a raw memory model, like C and C++, that does increase your liability. 
But all the things I'm going to look at here are related to, you can apply in other languages. So here's a piece of code, which obviously you can see at the back. Yes, good. Um, uh, and what I want to do is I want to go through this piece of code and simplify it. Because the original goal of this was actually simplification. And then I realized that half of what I was talking about actually has, a, that fits directly with the message of what we're talking about here. We are reducing the idea of code as risk. So first of all, I'm going to give you a quick tour, just run through uh, this, um, just to uh, get a sense of what are all the things that are potentially um, uh, reveal some kind of vulnerability or involved in some kind of vulnerability. There you go. For those of you who are red, green, colorblind, like me, uh, that's um, half the lines. Um, so, wow. Let's go and have a quick look at these guys. So what have we got? We've got a bunch of declarations, um, helpfully called declarations, just so you know. Um, we've got some information about getting some config, and we get some more config, and then we get some more config, and we do things. Oh, so much code is imperative. It's all about the doing. And then finally, we actually do something meaningful. We do a conversion, and then we do some more. We do some checking, and finally, we return somebody a result. OK, so let's go back to this. The first thing I'm going to notice is all of these wretched comments. OK, what is the thing you're going to do with lots of sections that are commented? Method. Huh? Methods. Methods, you're going to factor that. No, you're going to correct the spelling mistakes. <laughs> right. Now, check it in. <laughs> now delete them. OK? OK, I did say I'm into words and language. You know, I'm going to check those spelling mistakes. They really bug me. OK, now, now you've got a version that's got the correct version of the comments, should anybody want to roll back to that. OK, then we get rid of them. OK, let's go through piece by piece. There's all these declarations up at the top. And C was a block-structured language, still is a block-structured language. That means you can put variables in blocks. A lot of people are not, were not aware of this. And I remember saying this to a colleague, and he said, oh, that's just your crazy C++ stuff. You can move that. You can move the, and I said, no, no, really, it's, it's, it's C. You can actually look in K and R. They've got examples there. He said, well, how long has that been in C language? Well, I don't know, 1971, 72? Oh. <laughs> so let's redistribute the variables so that we reduce the distance. We increase the awareness that we have. Humans are really good at chunking. So let's play to our strengths instead of playing to our weaknesses. We're very poor when things are fragmented. We cannot reason about them. So let's allow somebody to reason confidently about the code. Let's move things to where they need to be. So we'll do that. OK, that's the first step. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is uh, this code was originally uh, old C++, but it was being compiled using a C++11 compiler. And C++11 bears about as much resemblance to classic C as perhaps uh, modern English does to Anglo-Saxon. Um, it's, yeah, you can kind of compile it, but really, there's an awful lot more there. So let's just tidy a few things up. I'm going to tidy up some declarations, um, and we'll continue doing that. Let's just focus in. We've got some stuff going on here. Oh, look at that going on. Well, uh, what's, what's the issue here? Yeah, it turns out you're never going to get a null pointer in these cases. This is just noisy code. It prevents people from actually seeing the condition. There is no situation in which a null will be returned, so therefore we get rid of that. OK. Um, we might want to be memory safe. So sometimes people try and use a smart pointer. Problem is that this is a C++ 98 smart pointer, so we're using older versions. So this is a very important generalized observation, is that the, you, we do actually care. When people say, I want to upgrade stuff, when people say, I want to use a new library, I want to avoid using deprecated features, they have a very strong case in their favor. It's not just because they want to try new shiny things, but I'm just going to refer you back to the idea that older code, older libraries, is more likely to be error prone and more likely to have vulnerabilities. So therefore, there is a very good reason to stay up to date with stuff. Auto pointer is deprecated, um, so we shouldn't use that. We should use unique pointer. However, this is too early in the process uh, to change the signature of the method, so I'm going to move that one out. Um, and we're just going to keep it private, and then we'll come back when we change the signature. I'm not going to change the signature at the moment, because as a statically typed language, you have lots of excitement in breaking things. So let's not do that just yet. OK, now, the next thing. The next thing is a little more interesting. The next thing is I'm going to focus on these things. You've got these little, uh, you, there's this obsession that people have with um, Getting, using, a, uh, using a, a language like C++, using a language that actually does have a few high-level bits and pieces, and then completely ignoring them. Um, we generally call this C++. OK? 
Okay? So we're going to use strings, except we're not really going to use strings. We're going to use strings, and then we're going to go inside them, and we're going to go, yeah, I'm just going to get that pointer out of you. I know you said you were a nice string object, but I really want your raw char pointers. I want to see that null. You know, it's just like this is, this is keyhole surgery with a sledgehammer. Now, the problem is that, curiously enough, this works by coincidence. There's a data function. Data doesn't guarantee it's null terminated, which is something that C has a very strong opinion about. If something's not null terminated, you get lots of exciting possibilities for, ooh, let's see, buffer overflow, one of the, still one of the world's most popular forms of attack. It turns out that C++11 tidied this one up, but it also told us way back when, you, if you want the underlying C string, you can ask politely. You can manifest your intention and say, I want the C string. I don't merely want your data. Data is a terrible name anyway for anything. Uh, Peter Hilton um, is based in the Netherlands. He did a study on variable names. Most popular variable name that's longer than one character turns out to be data. He did a GitHub survey. Turns out the second most popular is data too. <laughs> so, okay, that's a very minor one, but let's move on to another area, which is there's all these things, sprintfs. If you want vulnerability, it's spelt printf. A lot of people think, oh, I'm just formatting a string. Printf is an interpreter. It is a language. It is not far removed from basically saying, I wish to evaluate content. Please, I invite your, I invite your injection attacks. I invite cross-site scripting, all the rest of it. This is the gateway. This is the gateway. And everything else in other languages that has an eval or any kind of interpreter, you need to recognize that whenever you're using something like printf, it is a whole language. And it allows all kinds of exciting things. So it is, at one level, equivalent to a very modest form of eval. And that's not something you really want. But it's conveniently spelt close to this. Yeah, the classic example of an injection attack is beautifully covered in this XKCD. Hi, this is your son's school. We're having some computer trouble. Oh dear, did he break something? In a way. Did you really name your son Robert? Et cetera, et cetera. Oh yes, little Bobby Tables we call him. Well, we've lost this year's student records. I hope you're happy. And I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. This is a point. I.O. Remember I said earlier on, boundaries. That's what you need to guard. It's all about the boundaries. It actually, it doesn't really matter if there's C++ in the core of your application. It's the stuff that's at the edge you need to worry about. And it doesn't all look like memory-based memory, uh, memory -based languages. It turns out that you can quite happily have interpreted languages, softer languages. Any language that allows you to embed content within something else immediately opens up these possibilities. The simple way of looking at these are all about escape codes. As I've observed in the past, every escape is an entrance. Okay? That's the way you need to think about this stuff. You need to guard this very, very strongly. So we can get rid of that and say, nope. That sprintf should not be there. I can use a more valid, uh, secure C version, SN printf, but actually this is C++. I can simplify it even further. I can actually look at the content, realize we shouldn't be formatting strings anyway for this kind of thing. These are almost always constant. And progressively, the code reduces. And the next thing I might do is notice this terrible habit, this terrible but popular habit of, I've got an error, so I'm going to Log it and throw, log and throw, log and throw. If you ask some people, what does your system do? Well, mostly it logs and throws. Does it do anything else? Yeah, we've got some stuff in there about insurance. You know, or maybe it's a games platform, but mostly it logs and throws. If you look at some code bases, that's what they seem to do. They seem to be dominated by this stuff. So in theory, I could reduce that, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass it away and say, you know what, I'm not interested in that. I'm just going to say fail to connect. We'll come back and deal with that later. Well, maybe not. Um, and because I like my code to be less noisy, there's an awful lot of open, uh, closed, curly bracket there. We can get rid of that and reduce that to one line, which has some people go, oh, can you do that? Yes, you can, and you're perfectly entitled to. Um, isn't that the basis of the go-to fail? Ah, well, I'm going to introduce you to a really cool idea. It's called a static analysis tool. It's, a, it's an extension of your compiler. If you're working in a dynamically typed language, you need one of these, okay, as well. In other words, the idea is don't just go with what the compiler says. Extend your reach. So we can zoom in now. And we can notice this kind of beautiful, gentle repetition. This kind of lulls you to sleep. Let's pick on something else. Let's pick on the signature. At this point, I'm comfortable making a change. 
I'm also going to move away from this wretched, um, I, best, I guess I, I call it object-oriented assembler. This rather this terrible debasing of language, where people walk around and their only vocabulary is create and get and set and all of these kinds of primitive words. Nobody ever wants to create a server connection. Or rather, we've created a server connection, we've got a new expression. You don't want to create a server connection. What you want to do is connect to a server. Okay? Yeah. Pitch your code at the right level. Stop describing the assembler version of your code. Communicate. This is what it takes to connect to a server. Offer the reader the right level of abstraction. Communicate with them. It's an act of communication. If you communicate to your reader, they will listen. They will learn. This is about knowledge. It's about the ability to reason. Then we're going to go inside. <sighs> OK, Configur configuration manager, colon, colon, instance, dot, get value. <sighs> Okay, well, let's, let's try turning this into English. Um, configuration manager instance get value. No, configuration manager instance value of. Configure, oh, we don't need the manager word there. Who knew? Yeah, it's just like people kind of pad out their words. Oh, you know, here's a thing. Can you call it a thing? No, I need to call it a thing controller manager proxy. Yeah, but that's not the real one. Oh, the abstract thing controller manager proxy. Yeah. Do we have a factory for that? Yes, we do. And that, guess what it's called? No. No, 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 stop. It's a thing. Call it what it is. Now, there is still a problem with this. Now, a lot of people think, oh, oh, Kevin's going to talk about singletons. Yes, he is. There you go. When we're done. Um, because there's another problem here. Yes, it is a whiskey. Yes, it is better for your code. OK, that's all you need to know. Yeah. So there was a paper um, published uh, last year um, at, Usenic, at a Usenix conference. Um, early detection of configuration errors to reduce failure damage. If you notice, we've just been using all of the, we haven't actually done much validation. All we did in that code was check whether or not the data was empty. That was it. It turns out that studying across a number of systems, and we're applying a particular tool, which is not the focus of this talk, our study shows that many of today's mature, widely used software systems are subject to latent configuration errors in their critically important configurations, those related to reliability, and all the rest of it. Latent configuration error. That's a polite way of saying we didn't check it when we ran. Okay? We, we got it at first point of use, something bad happens. How often? Well, across the, it's quite a wide range. Some systems, it's over 90%. But these configurations do not have any special code for checking the correctness of their settings at the system's initialization time. That setting is about everything. That setting is about who is using the system. That is settings all about how the system runs. And these are not checked. Now, this can give you exciting runtime errors, but it also opens and reveals uh, and enlarges an attack surface area. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to observe that this is not a singleton issue. It's not the job of this function to know how to validate these two configuration aspects. It's the job of whoever calls it. So we move that up. Whoever calls it, they are responsible for that. Because this code turns out it's repeated all over the place. Whoever gives you the data. In fact, it turns out there's another aspect. And this is where I'm going to go against one of the classic um, observations from John Postal, which made it into the, uh, one of the early RFCs for TCP. Postal's law we often use as a way of describing general you know, acceptability or tolerance of code. Be conservative in what you do. Be liberal in what you accept from others. Actually, I think that that's too general. Be conservative in what you do, but be conservative in what you accept from others. Actually, it is your, the job of your code to be as hardline as possible. And this, this applies both in the large and in the small. And if that means certain things don't connect, then that's fine. That actually gives you better long-term compatibility as people shift standards. But it also turns out to be relevant in the context of your code. Why am I accepting strings? An address, is not a, a an address is not a string. A port is not a string. We already have types for those from the, for in a standard C library. So I'm not changing the language here, but I'm actually showing you this is what you can do if you actually use the language. Now, you may notice that we've managed to reduce a surprising amount of code. I've changed font size. I could change it again and actually fill up the screen. And then we look a little more closely. Because it turns out that it's not the job of an object if, a, if an object cannot be created correctly, don't have a conversation with it. Are you OK? Yeah, is that OK for you? Are we good? No. 
if the job of the construction of the object, if you cannot create a valid instance, then you do not have a valid instance. It's as simple as that. It's a profound and very simple existential concept. So therefore, it should fail on creation, which allows us this, which, you know what? Actually, we don't need any of this code at all, it turns out. It's one of my favorite refactoring exercises. At this point, this could be any language, because it turns out it's the same idea. We have certain habits. All of those things that we say are bad code, poor code, and so on, they're not created randomly. They're created through certain systematic habits. And that was one of the things that my client had. They had the log and throw habit. They had the late binding and configuration through a singleton habit. They had a number of these things. And if you write code like that, you can turn Hello World into an enterprise masterpiece. OK? It's a, it, people don't create code randomly. It's a systematic approach. So observations from this. First observation. There is no code faster than no code. That's from the Talgent Guide to Designing co uh, uh, Programs. There is no code more secure than no code. It's really difficult to hack something when it isn't there. And that's one of the key things. If you want to reduce the surface area, reduce the volume. Then we have other things. And people go, oh, well, that's fine. We're using JavaScript. <laughs> so about a year ago, it turns out that a lot of people depended on a few lines of code. Um, and uh, for various reasons that were, uh, I'm not going to go into here, um, the author of that code pulled, pulled his code from uh, NPM, and large parts of the internet stopped working. So let's have a look at this code that is really important. Now, if you have open source code, I salute you. It's a great contribution. And that's, that's wonderful. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's good. One of the other things about open source is gather other people's opinions, see what they say, get their feedback. But to be, to be honest here, this is not necessarily the greatest code, but it does something very trivial. It pads out a string. It turns out lots of people were including this just to pad out a string. I'm, I'm going I'm to suggest that this is not one of those really hard problems. This is, this is something, perhaps, that we should be able to do. When this was pulled, somebody went and replaced it with this, which actually uh, is more complex and shows some slightly deeper misunderstandings of code, which makes me incite Anderson's law. I have yet to see any problem, however complicated, which, when you looked at it in the right way, did not become still more complicated. We need to be moving in the opposite direction. But that's not why I'm, that's not why I'm here, because there wasn't really a security issue there. Or was there? Because let's be serious. We are taking on dependencies. We're taking on needless dependencies. If you've not seen the O'Reilly series of joke titles, these are wonderful. Yeah? Because code written by some stranger on the internet is always perfect. <laughs> so people are just depending on stuff. And they are depending on stuff. I have no problem with you depending on stuff if you know that you're depending on it. The problem is a lot of people did not know that there was a transitive dependency. They did not know that this was sitting beneath what they had chosen. And dependencies are part of your architecture. So when somebody goes ahead and does this, this was, a, this was unprecedented. And th there was a lot of discussion about this. Hey, NPM users left pad, it was unpublished, breaking lots of builds. To fix, we are un-unpublishing it at the request of the new owner. So hang on, there's a lot of websites out there that are just taking on trust a piece of code. And now somebody's able to just upload an alternative version. Hell, what if the original developer decided to do that? And instead of having this, then replaced it with something with a little bit of fun. So let's be very serious here. When you have a dependency on something else and you wander around going, our system's secure, then one of these statements is not correct. You need to guard your boundaries. This is, uh, when, we look, when we talk about architecture, one of the definitions that Grady Booch offers us on architecture, architectural decisions tend to concentrate on upon identifying controlling the themes in a system, which are described in terms of interfaces and mechanisms. Now, normally we think purely in terms of the abstractions of the language. But whenever you introduce a process boundary, your DLL boundary, a JAR boundary, or any of these boundaries, you're saying something significant about who gets to touch and deploy these things. These are one of the simplest ways of you know, uh, revealing an insecurity in the system and just spoofing in, not spoofing cleverly on the wire, but just spoofing via repository or spoofing via somebody's user ID, because it turns out that, yes, indeed, um, people are sometimes the weakest link. If you can get one of the developers, you can get their login, then you can do all kinds of stuff. So it's a very simple idea. Do you know your dependencies? 
And what is the criticality of those things? So uh, Maya Lehman made this wonderful observation. It's around 1980. He said, as mankind relies more and more on the software that controls the computers that in turn guide society, it becomes crucial that people control absolutely the programs and processes by which they are produced throughout the useful life of the program. And that's a point here. Are you controlling the dependencies? When you said we'll use that library, to what extent are you controlling that dependency? Have you safeguarded that? What have you thought about it? What, what happens if that's taken away? It's a very good question. What are the consequences if it's taken away? If the consequences are minimal, then that's fine. But you need to evaluate that before coming to that conclusion. But what about the processes? So I'm going to go back to something I mentioned right at the beginning. Mike Bland's piece. Really, it's a long read. Um, it's, hosted, it's, a, it's an essay of many parts uh, hosted on Martin Fowler's site. Um, Go to fail, heart bleeding the unit testing culture. And he makes some really important points here. And he explores all of these details. Um, as he says, these bugs are as instructive as they, are, as they were devastating. They were rooted in the same programmer optimism, overconfidence, and haste that strike projects of all sizes and domains. These bugs arouse my passion because I've seen and lived the benefits of the unit testing. So he's thinking from these points of view. Let me just go back to that left pad example. There was this, and there was this. I ended up having a go doing this and replaced it. Slightly more recent version of uh, 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 JavaScript, um, so there's an extra, there's one line less there. But I can tell you that this is not functionally equivalent to these two. Now, surely when you replace something, it should be functionally equivalent. Well, how do I know this, and what are the differences? Well, I, I wrote a very simple test set of tests. You know, you can put it on two slides, including the framework. And this is what happens when you run the tests. This is the screen you get when you run the tests against my code for left pad. This is the screen you get, and red means bad, when you run it against the other two. It turns out not only were people using it, it wasn't a security vulnerability, but actually didn't quite do the correct thing. So it was actually wrong. This is the whole thing. You need to trust these things. This is why we have observations, like this one from Neil Ford. Testing is the engineering rigor of software development. It's very much that idea of something that gives a sense of reality and strength to what you're working on. I'm going to let them go first, because I'm polite. But I'm going to, I want to close by considering, when we look at testing, what is the role of testing here? Oh, I've lost focus. Um, how do you test? Let me just introduce you to three different ways of thinking. There's a passive approach, which we can call plain old unit testing, pouting. That's, you write the code, you test after. Okay, not too long after, but you test after. You've got an active approach, which is where the code doesn't really exist. You, you actively create the code and the tests alongside. Better known as test-driven development. But one that Mike Bland uses it in his article extensively, was something we might call DDT, defect-driven testing. The idea that in response to an observation, either external or a bug that you have found, whether it's an insecurity or just a, 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 a user annoyance, you are in a position to write a test that catches that and demonstrate that your system does not have this vulnerability, does not have this weakness. It's a very simple idea. And that's just a much richer idea. Because as this other paper from Usenic observes, simple testing can prevent most critical failures. How much? Uh, turns out, on a particular system they were looking at, specifically the non-fatal, uh, the, the fatal errors they were looking at, it was around 77% of production bugs could be reproduced by a unit test. So that's three quarters. Now, for some people, that's astonishingly high. For some people, it's astonishingly low. However, it's a number. It's a number you can do something with. It's a number you're never going to reach in advance, necessarily, but retrospectively, you can. There is this idea that this is not done. It's always an ongoing process. So is there anything? Well, I'm going to leave this one for the slides. It turns out the CERT guide, you know, top 10, well, top 12 secure coding practices, over half of them are to do with code quality and basic testing. So there's this idea that these are not optional extras. Sometimes people, oh, yeah, we'll deal with the code quality next year. This year, we want to make our code secure. We want to make our system secure. But we're not going to touch the code to do that. It's like, no, this is, one of the, this is one of the surfaces that you need to address. Because you want your system to have the classic qualities 
of an architecture. These are the qualities that the Roman architect Vitruvius observed of a good building. It should be firm, it should be robust, it should be strong, it should be resilient. It should be useful, it should serve a purpose, and it should work for that purpose. And Venustas, Venus, the goddess of beauty. It should also have some aesthetic. It should also be something that as a human being I can appreciate. And as a human being in the code, I want to be able to appreciate it on those terms. Thank you very much.